Hey everyone. Thanks for coming. We expect hundreds more, so be prepared. <laughs> My name is Sven Travis. I am a professor at the New School, more specifically Parsons School of Design in New York, where I have taught within the design and technology program for way longer than you want to hear about. Um, and we are super excited about this panel today because I think for those on the panel, all who have been integrally involved in the quantum work that we've been doing at the new school, it really represents a chance to think about what we've been working on over the past couple of years and to discuss the possibilities. So without further ado, let's dive in and I'll real briefly introduce the panelists. On the far side, we have Maya Georgieva, who is director of the Innovation Center within which Quantum lives at the New School. We have Russell Hoffman, who is Kiskit Design Lead, um, which somehow relates to IBM. He'll, he'll explain <laughs> this more. <laughs> we have Lin Zhou, who is the Chief Information Officer at the New School and my co-conspirator in the Quantum Collaboration Studio that we've been teaching at Parsons and the New School over the past couple of years. Um, you may know that none of us on this panel are scientists, and that's part of the point. We are here today to talk about possibilities for quantum beyond science and a little bit about our experience working with quantum in a truly unique university, the New School, which focuses heavily on art, design, music, social research, in an effort to change the world on those fronts, I suppose. But coming in here, I think for many of you, scientists or no on the panel, first question you'll ask is, well, what's quantum about? And I want to turn things over for a moment or two to Russell, who probably among us can provide the best explanation there. Russell. Yeah, sure. Um, and actually, before I really say anything else, I do need to disclaim that everything I say today, these thoughts and opinions are my own and not necessarily indicative of IBM strategies or positions. Okay. <laughs> well, that out of the way. <laughs> um, so uh, let's do a super quick just kind of introduction to quantum computing, and I'll do my best to keep the jargon to a minimum. But to me, the best way to explain it is that quantum computing is kind of like starting over and building a computer from scratch, right? We've used kind of fundamentally the same model of computing for, I don't know, the past 70 plus years. That, that wasn't the first model, it was just a particularly good one, but it's not perfect. There's actually still things our kind of, our digital or classical computers as we call them, um, can't do, right? And so about 40 years ago, a handful of really smart people said, what if we were to power a computer with quantum mechanics instead of the kind of the digital way we do it today? Is there anything new that we can do that we couldn't have otherwise done. And the scientists doing science and mathematicians doing math basically came up with the answer to say, yes, there are actually some certain gaps and things that we can do with quantum computers that we couldn't otherwise do with our classical computers, um, which has really led to where we are today of trying to research and build these machines. Um, and at, from going from that time of saying, yes, there's things we could theoretically do to actually building the machines has been a pretty interesting process of discovery um, where we're still looking and finding out new things kind of every day, it seems. Um, and that actually leads to kind of why we're here today is really the technology has been in the hands of the technologists, but this net new technology of really building a computer from the ground up again has some really interesting questions to say what happens when it gets in the hands of creative people? And what are these things that we can do that wasn't possible before from a creative perspective? And so I think that's kind of my quick, uh, super high level summary of quantum computing and hopefully what we'll touch on here. So. I'll ask Lynn, my colleague, uh, both in teaching and in 
pursuing the quantum engagement at the university to talk a little bit about what your ideas were for initially bringing it into the new school. Yeah, so um, I have to say you hear Swan talking about none of us here are hardcore uh, technologists or scientists. Um, I, I, one disclaimer I have to say is I do have a, I'm a trained physicist, used to be, and, but over the years, especially since I have two children, my physicist blood has been diluted. So <laughs> my children actually, we, we easily identify in the room where he sits, because he, he said he, he looks like me. So they, call, they started calling me a pseudo-physicist, because not a real <laughs> physicist anymore, uh, to be honest. So, but that experience, actually, with my children uh, taught me a hard lesson. I think in the past, when we talk about uh, literacy, we usually talk about reading and writing. But for this century, I think it's not enough. When we talk about literacy, we actually means that the children, the, everybody should be able to create harmony with technology, right? And quantum, as Russell said, as the next emerging and breakthrough technology has profound capability to solve problems that the classical computer cannot solve today. So from the adoption of technology point of view, I mean, uh, all the high, edu high education institutions, I, and I actually I just learned uh, some of the uh, K through 12 schools um, started uh, bringing the quantum you know, curriculum into their education. So we have the obligation uh, to help the society adopt the technology. And there are two dimensions. One is the technology itself. Uh, as companies like IBM, for example, and uh, along with others, um, they make the computer smaller, faster, and uh, cheaper for us to use. The se so I call that as uh, you, we, you actually put uh, technology on steroid. Second dimension is the broad adoption by the society, the acceptance, right? Because we know if we don't do it right with privacy, with social justice, we know those issues seems to be very you know, simple, but will backfire on us. So I call the second problem is the technology DNA problems. Uh, with the new school, we, for the past 100 years, we have created, we have uh, uh, produced uh, world-class thinkers, uh, designers, and uh, social justice movers. And uh, we will continue to focus on leveraging quantum computing, this wonderful technology, right? Really leveraging this uh, uh, technology to, on the social front and also leveraging the technology to improve the human conditions. And also we, we will not put technology on steroids, that's where the partnership is, but we will give the technology a good DNA at the beginning. Thanks, Lynn. Um, because Google says stuff like this, it's really important for me to inject here that at the new school, we have achieved quantum supremacy. <laughs> I just want to get that out there. One of the interesting things about our university is its idiosyncratic nature. In the middle of the new school is a gigantic and very well-known art and design school, Parsons School of Design. We have the Manus College of Music. Um, it's really a mix, a very mixed community. And Maya sits right in the middle of all of this, running the innovation lab, and has a chance to work with students from all of these pursuits, in addition to the traditional social sciences that the, the new school represents. Maya, would you say, like to say a few words about the transdisciplinary activity that you undertake at the Innovation Center? Sure, and thank you, Svan. Yes, the Innovation Center mission is really to kind of bring together the different communities on our campus and bring uh, our students from the performing arts with our students from design and technology with our creative writers and journalists and social scientists. Um, and it's really truly when we bring them together that we have this opportunity to enable that sort of innovation that, you know, look into uh, some of the emerging technologies and frontier technology like quantum computing like artificial intelligence or extended reality and give them an opportunity to think through it. 
and I think that it is incredible. It, uh, it brings you know, our students um, together with experts from industry, startups, in, to create that ecosystem of um, engaging like the quantum design jam or you know, creating prototypes, installations, uh, bringing sort of exhibitions and ap applications to life. And specifically, as we you know, really started this conversation about quantum technology and a quantum design jam at the new school, uh, we are very excited about the opportunity to give um, this kind of canvas, open canvas, uh, to our students to, to think and create. And what that actually enabled is an incredible high level of agency and engagement with our students um, in terms of thinking about what's possible and thinking through it with, you know, as they bring their own background to, to you know, the questions that um, they bring um, to the forefront of what would that mean? What would quantum technology mean um, in its impact to society? In addition to that, I think that one of the really interesting way is that it's so new and we're still learning it. And of course, you know, our students were kind of learning it at a fast pace and got to meet Russell and his colleagues, um, um, you know, Paul Kassebaum and James Weaver and think through like the fields of music and art and design. Um, uh, but also, I think it's uh, oftentimes they, they looked at it with a completely fresh eyes. Um, and, and artists and creators are really good at creating metaphors in explaining this new computing um, that is about you know, to come and become available. And I think that was really powerful. The, the, the types of, I think, projects that they engage was um, you know, radically different of what you see in terms of as you are working on, on, on this technology in a lab environment. And I think that was the most um, you know, amazing moment in the richness of these projects is you know, creating these metaphors and thinking through um, sort of just working, our students working their own kind of <laughs> brain cells through, um, through what's possible once we have a computing power like this and, and being able to, what kind of questions can we solve around health, uh, around security, around urban traffic. Um, so that was, that was, I think, really an interesting sort of um, intersection of, uh, of exploring these opportunities. Thanks, Maya. Um, so one of the questions that we'll get from the audience is, well, how does this work? Uh, has the new school built quantum computers? <laughs> the answer is yes, we actually have in secret. But mainly, <laughs> we are leaning on IBM who, I've, I've just got to say, have done something super cool with their KizKit project, um, which Russell will talk about a little more in a second. But uh, KizKit has been put over into open source. And Russell, what did KizKit stand for again? Quantum? You got it. OK, no, I'll tell you. Um, the Quantum Information Science Kit. So uh, just so everyone here understands how we operate and how you can operate, uh, KizKit is open. And it gives us access. It gives everyone access to running algorithms on real quantum computers. And if you're interested in this stuff, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of biased towards KizKit because we've been <laughs> using it. But go for it. It doesn't cost anything. They truly have put it out into the open source uh, world. And what this allows our students to do, regardless of how much they actually understand about the underlying quantum science and technology, is use the quantum computers in whatever way they may. And I wanted Russell to talk a little bit about what he does in his life uh, between operation as an artist and also a, a designer within KizKit, and maybe show us a few examples of, of projects that you're working on right now. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, so before I show a, a couple things, I, I'll set a little bit of context of why I think like this is such an exciting time to be working on quantum computing as like a creative person. And, and the general idea, I think, is that every type of medium of art can also be looked through as the lens of technology, right? So if, if it's photography, there's emulsion, if it's, there's paints, there's pigments, whatever those things may be, there's a chemistry, there's a layer of science behind those. And so I look at quantum computing in the same way to say that all, 
all mediums that come from any technology have a set of affordances that make them unique. And so when we talk about inventing a new type of computer from the ground up that is quantum computing, there are a set of affordances that make it unique. And the question is, how can we exploit those affordances for creative purposes? And to take that even a step further, to me, I think we're at the beginning of a new medium of art. But, that's, but it's so new and it's only really been a couple years that this technology has been available to the public that it's when we can start getting creative people in to say like what does this medium look like, right? I think that's kind of the question of the hour is what it actually happens when creative people start to say these are the things quantum computers can do and I'll rattle off some of them. So we're talking about superposition, entanglement, interference, and noise generally. So these four things, like if those are our affordances, then what happens when we start to put a creative lens on those and start looking at them? That was superposition, <laughs> entanglement, interference, uh -huh. and noise. Sorry. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> there are others, actually, but uh, I think we'll, we'll stick with those for now. So anyway, setting the stage there, I, 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 as someone who is lucky enough to have built a career working in emerging technology and also to be an artist, I just felt this obligation to, to start asking myself, well, is, there, is there something that's interesting and visual and just kind of pulling in my art background to see what happens. Um, and so I've been doing so for a couple years. I'll show some quick slides of some of the work I've been working on. But so this first one I'll show, which is kind of a slice in of this piece, is around uh, the quantum circuit. So a quantum circuit is what we call an algorithm, or um, it's kind of what the code looks like, to really showcase the circuit as this kind of like beautiful piece of execution and to see what's happening as this execution happens, right? So this is basically uh, the idea of, the, in this particular circuit, it's, it's uh, uh, from a gate called the Toffoli, uh, the Toffoli gate. But um, it's, as far as I know, going to be the first uh, fabricated and installed uh, piece of art that uses a quantum computer. And so this is actually taken this past weekend. So this is something that's actively happening right now. And to me, that's actually very exciting work to finally get to see it come to life. Thank you. Um, I'll show a couple others. There's uh, this one. IBM just released our new 127 qubit processor. Uh, to pull that back, a qubit is a quantum bit. Um, and I believe this is the first uh, processor to have more than 100 qubits. And so I decided to totally trivialize the technology and try and draw a picture with each qubit being a gate, or each qubit being a uh, pixel. Um, and so I took uh, Paul Rand's famous IBM Rebus and made a composition out of it. But part of what we can see in the composition is that this technology really still isn't perfect. There's a lot of kind of noise and there's a lot of kind of muddiness that comes with it. But to me, that's something that I quite like. That's actually a snapshot of one of those affordances is that right now these computers are in a place where there's still a lot of science and technology to be worked out, but for us as creative people, we can use the glitch uh, as something that could be pretty interesting. Um, I've done a couple of other ones. This was uh, a quantum alphabet series, and the one I wanna call it here is, I, I took a particularly famous quantum algorithm called the bernstein bazarani algorithm, and basically said, can I use it for something other than its intended purpose, right? I'm, there certainly wasn't to do an alphabet, but to see if I could take a cornerstone algorithm and repurpose it for artistic purposes. And so this is what we ended up getting. Close up of that. Um, so yeah, I, th that's I think just a snapshot of, to me, where I see the potential of what we could do artistically with quantum computing. But I think one of the exciting thing is, is when we did our design jam last year and we had more than 50 students using this technology, we got vastly and drastically different interpretations of the same thing. So I hope that someday there will be something of a quantum aesthetic that comes out that we can point to it and say like, this is what quantum art looks like, or at least a snapshot of kind of like the decade of the time that we're in. But I don't think that we're there yet, right? At, at best right now, we're in this mode of exploration, and those are just some examples of my explorations. A brief aside, when we began working with IBM's quantum computers, I was intrigued by the fact that IBM had located them all around the world. <laughs> These computers were in places like Rio, New Zealand, a couple spots in North America and Europe, just everywhere. And I blissfully would log into a computer in Johannesburg thinking, how cool is this? Until <laughs> one day I was told that actually those were just names. And in fact, all these computers lived where? In upstate New York? It's a secret. 
Oh, it's a secret. secret. <laughs> <laughs> But they are, they're just, we just thought, just named after cities where we have folks working on IBM Quantum. Yeah. I just don't want any of you to be misled in this regard. <laughs> so I'm just inserting this. Um, I want to go back. You mentioned the design jam. One of the really fun things that we did with this uh, last fall, kind of right in the middle of the pandemic, so it, it, has a, it's, it had its own set of challenges, was we kind of threw out this idea that we wanted to do a design jam. Lynn and I were teaching a, a class at the time, and so we expected our students, who we must have had 25 students or something, to join the jam. But it turned out that many, many more than that did. We must have had more than 100 Over students 100. Yeah, yeah. decide that they uh, wanted to join us, which meant that most of them were clueless. They uh, they were intrigued by the, the terms involved, and I think they would have liked us to provide them with t-shirts that said, quantum, that's the main thing they wanted. But click the slide forward one. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted uh, Maya to talk a little bit about this jam, because as Russell noted, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the jam consisted of a bunch of loosely preparatory sessions where students were invited to come in, uh, Russell, a couple of his colleagues gave some presentations, really providing some very brief overviews of the technology itself, but also how to access Kizkit, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I'm repeating myself, but super easy, and all of you should give it a <laughs> shot. Um, but uh, from there, the students formed groups. Yeah. We had, what, 20 groups, I think, mm -hmm. out of the total, and then just went off on their own. and. Maya, talk about how that worked, what some of your reactions were to the jam. Yes, I mean, I think one of the, the very first thing, we knew we were doing the very first quantum design jam for really creatives. And, and that was, I think, very compelling. And we're very honest with our students. And uh, But we anticipated as they would arrive that they also may just kind of look at it and say, maybe it's just too early or something. And so to kind of prompt them, instead of going directly to the science, we actually, and at the time I was very kind of in this conversation, I thought that the best way to engage them is actually for them to see work. And so we have to see actually the creative work um, that is already like, mm -hmm. um, that Russell is working on, that James Weaver is working on the intersection of quantum and music, um, which is amazing and uh, you should definitely check it out in our students. You know, particularly the performance and music students were very um, excited about that. So we started with actually them seeing um, already some of that work um, as it's creative in its creative context. Um, and then um, we actually structured this over the, the course of um, two weeks and kind of two weekends. Uh, we then brought um, back our colleagues for IBM to really you know, walk our, our students through the science of it. And some of that in, in did go for long, sort of uh, lengthy sessions, um, re fall, so some of them going kind of deeper into the evening. And what I was really, just really surprised that we, we were seeing everybody staying on. So everybody was staying on, um, kind of following the trend and just really fascinated and some of the things um, they, were, they were seeing and the questions that were coming, it was definitely um, very, you know, it's, it's bec it was becoming interactive and we knew that uh, these students are going to stay with us and they did. Um, we actually have 14 teams uh, then that self-formed, work over the weekend. We have our, our experts, their mentors, uh, additional uh, mentors from IBM join us at that point to work with the students in kind of really um, shaping up some of their ideas and concepts uh, around different fields. Um, and uh, it, was, it was still very much a high, kind of very fast paced um, given the, you know, given sort of the, that you really need some time to work out quantum computing sort of concepts and the phenomena that they present in your head for our students, but uh, very, very highly engaged. Our students kind of move into, uh, and uh, essentially we had them pitch those concepts. 
Um, and this is what you see here is part of that day, you know, students pitching um, the concepts and actually you see Paul and um, uh, Austin Fong, who is um, uh, actually also from IBM in New York City where we had this conversation in the blue shirt uh, on that front couch and then behind our students. Um, and that is the only one day which we actually met in person for, uh, I think nobody wanted to leave. I think it was um, really- Well, I IBM provided free food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, very engaged way. And we have, we have quantum and fashion. Uh, we had quantum and gender, quantum and film. Uh, fascinating. Um, our students produced um, short videos and then explore that in the context of, you know, just both in terms of visualizing some of the phenomena, but also in terms of, um, you know, kind of pursuing this exploration, which Russell was talking about. Um, and some of them put fashion, crypto, and quantum. And, and that is sort of, I think that's where you know, bringing a emerging technology like these, these really frontier technologies and in code in particular also as, as a language in, in a creative setting is, um, it's really fascinating and I think opens up, uh, just opens up imaginative projects that sometimes don't exist, don't may not necessarily take place in the lab and so we were talking yesterday and I said, you know, ultimately we took what you know, IBM was doing in the lab and brought it to the world and we want to see that impact and want to be part of that, part of explaining what would that mean living in a world with quantum computing. Um, and, and art is one expression and one way to um, really create those pathways. So uh, we, um, if you, you know, there will be a point where we share um, a sort of information of how you can learn if you're interested for our next quantum jam in, in the fall. Uh, and in addition to our students who, you know, we it, double and triple in numbers that we expected to, uh, we did have a number of people who found us on the web and wanted to take part. And so uh, we're thinking about that. So stay tuned, there's a stay tuned sort of way on our website later on where you can um, continue to, to hear updates as we, as we design the next jam. Yeah, one interesting thing was that most of the people who represented IBM at the jam uh, immediately resigned from their jobs afterwards <laughs> and enrolled at Parsons in a new school as students. <laughs> so it was fun. Uh, one of the things I will say, except for Russell, he stayed at <laughs> IBM. We needed a connection over there. Um, I will say that I, I too often underestimate students. and. Uh, you know, you can tell me it's a bad thing to do, but I don't want to take for granted how students will engage with technology. Uh, one of the really interesting things for me that came out of this jam was the tendency of students to want, once they found out that they were going to be able to really run stuff on the quantum computers, that became a really central element of the way in which they were able to generate some of these. Uh, uh, quite intriguing visuals, and I won't get into explaining how, but uh, the, these last pieces that you see here, these uh, paintings really uh, are coming out of uh, the use of quantum noise to uh, generate um, output, actually in this case from P5JS, which it, mm -hmm. for those of you who are familiar is a widely used creative toolkit now. Uh, but I did want to make this point that, that uh, I think we were all surprised in a, in a very positive way the extent to which students were willing to push the, push the boundaries, push the envelope, and that we didn't really, once we held their hands for a little bit, it was more just letting them go and see where they went. Um, I, I want to turn back to Lynn for a moment and ask him, you know, you. Lynn, I apologize for not introducing you as a physicist, but... Um, <laughs> no, it's a pseudo-physicist. Pseudo-physicist, <laughs> yes. But, you know, Lynn came over to, um, came over to the new school from IBM, actually. Um, he was one of the people who, after the jam, resigned and took a job at the new school. <laughs> no, he wasn't. 
But uh, he, was, uh, he was coming into an environment that he had had a chance to work around. He was very active in, in working with universities while at IBM. But Lynn, what's it been like to look at how a technology like quantum can be integrated into a university? Granted, there are, I think, great programs like Design and Technology at Parsons, but in general, you wouldn't look at the new school as a mecca for you know, technology. What's it been like to come in and work with a socially oriented institution? Yeah, so uh, to me, uh, as Ryan said, I met a, a very exciting career uh, change uh, in 2019 uh, when the new school turned 100 year old. Um, I transitioned from IBM into the new school. Um, and my experience, my last experience with IBM was uh, leading the Watson education uh, from a startup uh, into a, uh, one of the global leaders in applying artificial intelligence uh, in education. So those experience uh, has really led me to see that um, whenever there is a technology breakthrough, usually um, the uh, leading use cases are not actually in liberal arts field. Usually if you think about AI, you know, the, the leading use case for AI is uh, financial uh, technology, cybersecurity, um, you know, the visual, uh, the, the um, uh, vision, uh, they call computer vision, this recognition of your facials, voice recognition, synthesizing of the voice. Um, and uh, liberal arts usually is afterthought, right? It's afterthought. When those problems are, uh, are figured out, then they say, oh, how about music? How about design? How about fashion? And um, uh, the joining new school really, for me, is open, open up a new horizon uh, for me to think about you know, my partner here with Sven. Uh, we think about, well, this got to stop because the arts, music, designs impact people's daily life. And whenever we have a new technology breakthrough like, like, such as quantum, such a wonderful technology, this ought to be one of the front runners um, uh, as the new technology being adopted. So I think that connection made with IBM is a fantastic one. Because okay? obviously, even we have a secret computer, uh, you know, quantum computer programs in the new school. We, you know, a typical quantum computer takes billions of dollars uh, uh, to to make, and a tremendous amount of um, expertise goes into that. I think that really the leverage of uh, the um, technology providers from IBM and also our social justice and our art and the design schools really allow us to make this a successful program, really transform our student experience, and also ultimately help the society in the long run. And uh, you know, I'd add to that that it's extremely rare, and I think all of you know this, it's extremely rare for creatives to get access to technology in the early days of development. I think one of the things we're hoping for here is that the evolution of quantum could happen in a different way than, I mean, you mentioned AI and machine learning, but we can go back to any number of technologies over the last couple of decades where, to be honest, we're getting access to it or, or engaging with it on a regular basis, usually after the technology is fairly fully developed. And uh, I want to uh, uh, I, I want to drive my compatriots a little bit crazy here. I'm going to go back to a project that's very close to my heart which is this project, the quantum tractor project. And I want to use it as an example to move into what hopefully would be an open discussion here and we would certainly ask people for questions. Uh, the quantum tractor project is a real project. It involves my Farmall Super C tractor, <laughs> which is a real tractor, my friend. Uh, this is not in the middle of New York City. This is at our top secret quantum research laboratory <laughs> somewhere in upstate. Um, but you know, the question that I often get asked here, and I can only reveal a certain amount about this project, is what's the deal? This just looks like a tractor. I'm looking at Laura here because she's good at asking that question. And actually, herein starts the point, and it's why a couple summers ago, I ran a studio called Quantum Tractor Project with our graduate students within our design and technology program 
Because I was simply asking the question, how is it possible to combine what is emerging, really cutting edge technology, uh, technology that's not fully developed, with fundamental, primitive, real world stuff. In this case, a tractor. A 1951 Farmall Super C. What's interesting is that the project itself has had a life because of this question. I'm not going to take time to show what's come out of it. There's actually more to this tractor than meets the eye now. In fact, my wife is still asking me this question. What are you doing with that tractor? I love my wife. How about the noise? Where did the noise come from? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to move a few steps forward into one of these beautiful art pieces. I want to show this one and uh, suggest that as the students have worked on this art, this is a, a version of quantum Tetris that was developed at the Design Jam. And the students ask a very simple question. It's very similar to my tractor question. What happens if we're able to connect an actual quantum computer to the traditional Tetris game? Does it change it? They found actually that it changed it quite a bit. But are the implications of this change something that, in fact, we could apply to a wide variety of projects? Because I like this picture. It's very funny. Originally, I thought this was just a rendering. And I realized only this morning that it's actually real. They actually built this thing, uh, which is good. It means they're putting their hands on things physically. But um, we want to stop there and, and just open the discussion. Uh, we remain, the four of us and many more at both IBM and the New School, very engaged with this. The projects have now moved beyond the course that Lynn and I are teaching to new courses. We've got a course going on right now called Quantum Futures, taught by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Um, we have uh, students undertaking thesis projects in quantum, and Maya in the Innovation Center is initiating a number of workshops around the topic. So we're interested in what people think about all of this and, and just kind of want to open it up now for questions. We've got plenty to further the discussion if needed, but uh, let's just put it open. Yes. No. Yeah. I, I, so the question is uh, really more about the relationship between IBM and the New School. Um, IBM right now. Well, actually, let me even back up from that because I think there's a little bit to add here. Um, we make quantum computers, but it doesn't really make sense if there's nobody to use them, right? So we have a pretty big partnership initiative happening right now, and now traditionally our partnerships are with big technical schools like MIT and things like that. So doing something with a new school is kind of a departure, and, and actually it's kind of why this panel I think is fun and different, right? Um, but uh, it's, it's not even just universities, right? We're really looking to get quantum computing in the hands of as many people as we can. Um, which is why Kiskit is open source, right? We're actually really trying to build the quantum workforce of tomorrow so that we can actually have people to use these machines and start doing quantum work. Um, and we actually also make tons and tons of learning uh, resources uh, for free and public and open source as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Russell, I want to extend that because one of the amazing things for anyone out there, it's a good question, for anyone out there who's wondering, well, you know, how easy is this stuff to access? It's not only very easy to access, but, but Kiskit, the organization, you know, really pushed by IBM, has done a superb job of putting together tutorials. I mean, we're all used to going to a variety of locations online and finding tutorials on just about everything. This is a little bit in a different league. I mean, these guys have really worked hard to provide support. Um, there's a full textbook mm -hmm. on Kids Kid out there. It's all free, readily open, et cetera. And uh, it's made it super easy for us to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because it's, you know, it's basically represented work that we didn't have to do and that we could just turn students over to and they run with it. So I went out here looking at this stuff or even just wondering how you could bring it into play, whether uh, you know, you're from education or from you know, the broader world, it's super easy. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there really no, I mean, I, you, I think you guys have done almost everything to lower the, uh, Trying. <laughs> the entry. Yeah. I mean, it, it just is, uh, you know, any student who's come my way, I just point to the links on KizKid, and they, they usually don't come back. Learn.kizkid.org. <laughs> don't come back. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yes? What type of social good projects emerge from this combining design and quantum? I'll dive in. Um, I think right now it's a little bit of a work in progress. The new school is extremely focused on social engagement and more specifically on social equity. I know the discussions within the class and to a certain extent across the jam have been very focused on the idea of what it means to gain access to a technology like this early on. There's a ton of discussion out there in the world right now about bias, about inappropriate uses of technology, etc. We're not dreaming that we're suddenly going to have huge influence about the way quantum gets you know, implemented. But what we are hopeful is that if we've got social scientists and creatives involved in this at an early point, that at least they can um, establish some mode of thinking that may counter what I think we all know are some of the tendencies of big tech, which I'm sorry, but IBM to me still represents to some extent. If I can just add to that, I, I think part of the uh, discussion about social justice uh, is about uh, inequality in accessing the technology. So like Maya, she is a senior director for the New School Innovation Center. When we set it up, um, there were three uh, missions of that. One of them is to engage the local community in New York City community, if you are, if you are residents um, you know, of New York City uh, uh, city welcome, you can come to our innovation lab and we will provide access for you to accessing beyond just quantum but also non-quantum uh, uh, um, other technology as well. So through that front, we want to start balancing um, uh, the social justice and we want to uh, provide more access to those scared resources as well. Well, too bad, you just missed the, you just missed the community engagement. <laughs> I want to get this right. You were in New York for 22 years and you just moved to Austin? Yeah, I moved my entire agency to Austin. You're welcome to come back. <laughs> <laughs> there was another question out here. I, yeah, you make Ah, standing by the microphone worked. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Russell, congrats on passing the 100 qubit mark. Thank you. I know uh, IBM has laid out a roadmap to hit over 1,000 qubits. What are some of the possibilities or possible use cases that really excite you about hitting that 1,000 qubit mark? That's my favorite, one of my favorite questions. So the question is basically, what can we start doing with quantum computers as we start to get closer to like 1,000 qubits, which we hope to achieve in just the next couple of years? Um, it's a surprisingly hard question because the way we look at it is qubits are not the only metric to which we should be looking at the abilities of a quantum computer. They're obviously very important. But the more qubits you have, the more possibilities for things like noise that are going to make your system less uh, able to um, do, com do the computations you want it to do, right? Um, so there's we have literally teams of people that are looking at near-term algorithms that are basically saying, before we get to the really good quantum computers that we call fault tolerant, are there things that we can start doing? And actually, by having lots of qubits, we're starting to look at basically, can we redundantly run algorithms on the same machine and see if we can get a higher level of accuracy and things around like that. The, I'll interpret your question slightly differently and say that like, what are some of the very first things we can do that are that are not possible of what current computers can do. Um, and <coughs> if I had to make a bet, I would say it's around simulating quantum systems. Uh, it sounds almost obvious, right? A quantum computer can do quantum things, right? But it, it, the odds are pretty good that will be the beginning of it. 
again, I speak for myself in this case. Um, and, but that'll have a lot of really interesting implications for things around like sciences and medicine and all sorts of uh, kind of like hard science that are totally under the hood that the way we see it as, uh, as people who aren't deep in the labs don't actually know. So we'll see. I don't know. It's really exciting, actually, because we're getting pretty close. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, just a supplement. I think uh, um, when we talk, when you talk about 100 qubits, you're not just talking about the number of qubits, right? The quality, like uh, Russell said, the quality, is, uh, the you know, the, the noise, uh, the coherence time, mm -hmm. and uh, many other things considered in the quantum uh, volume is important. But that's really opening up the frontier, right? Yep. From simulations, um, you know, risk management. Uh, many other things. We, we and actually, to be really specific about it, we measure quantum computers by number of qubits. We do it by quality, which is what he was saying is quantum volume, and we do it by uh, speed. Um, and really, it has to be a mixture of all these things. So it's like, yes, our roadmap is marching towards these bigger, better computers, but it's a startlingly complex set of things that have to come together. So. And you should also remember where in the world the computer is located. That's <laughs> yes. Speaking of names of cities, I don't know if that's a common practice everywhere and what the reason would be. I just left Microsoft as a director of innovation for Windows, and we named everything over the names of cities for some reason. I don't understand and it. And it's all about fooling your clients. Right? Yeah, it is. Like, <laughs> it just picks up everything if, you, if they search for it internally. Anyways, um, my re running into the session was very serendipitous, and I'm really glad, but I'm very uneducated about quantum computing. Um, but I'm, I work on operating systems, and I just love to start uh, a company uh, to build an operating system for sovereign computing, where um, you own your own data, you own your own computation, and have full agency around it, and how it interacts with everything else. I'm very, very curious to know um, how the all the um, uh, innovation sprints and ideations and all of these creation of new ways of interacting with quantum uh, computing while it's at kind of assembly level so the abstraction is very far from where we would talk about like operating system that sits on it and what human computer interaction models would be enabled are you on either side um, approaching that, like have constructs to start kind of grabbing and looking for ideas that emerge from that perspective, like going from like the mouse and the screen and the keyboard and, you know, touch and natural UI. What is it going to be the human computer interaction, like UX system that now is, will be enabled that we don't have today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, t I can take a swing at that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll actually take two approaches to it. The first one is, is we're quite confident that quantum computing will work alongside classical computing. In other words, if you're, and also the, you probably won't have like one in your laptop, right? But in the same way that you have a GPU and a CPU, there could be a QPU, right? Okay. But we, we don't actually know what that like model of computing will look like. But realistically speaking, it won't be a total split. So in terms of kind of the, the user experience model of how you interact with them is probably going to be relatively similar to the way you do with classical, assuming we're, this hybrid model is actually the thing that happens. That's answer number one. And answer number two is that if you are operating at the level, the level of working at quantum assembly or actually interacting directly with it, we are, actually my team does this, we're constantly looking at new ways of interactions. So one of them is we have a product called the Quantum Composer and it's, it kind of uses a, me, uh, a, a musical metaphor where you are be able to click and drag uh, quantum logic gates onto qubits and kind of do and sculpt quantum circuits using uh, I guess it is kind of like a net new type of interaction, but it's also just like a drag and drop editor kind of thing. Um, th that's the one we're using right now, but I, I don't know, we've got like sketchbooks full of random quirky ideas of different ways to do it, and some of them are absolutely terrible, but hopefully some will stick and it can be pretty fun, so we'll see. A actually, and I'll add on there too, that's where I think the value of having creative people in the field comes in really, really, where it's really important, right? where it's like we have people who specialize in thinking about interface design and user experience. And traditionally that's not, like the, the majority of interacting with quantum computers is through the realm of code. And so we need creative people to be in the industry so we can start thinking about how people interact with them. Um, I feel like there should be PhD programs dedicated to the subject. So, it, I, I mean, it's great. Like, we'll really, we don't know yet, so it's kind of cool. Although I would say good luck with your endeavor. No, this is a really important zone, and it actually crosses over to what I was saying a moment ago, that 
it's extremely rare for us to gain interaction with technology like this early enough to actually influence it. Mm -hmm. I won't claim that that influence has happened, but you know, intrigued about <coughs> what the possibilities are. Yep. Are, so, you, yeah. are you located here? No, I'm in Seattle, and I think you mentored me when I was at iBeam. <laughs> Ten years ago. <laughs> cool talk. Uh, but can I go just slightly? I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Maria? Maya. Yes. Maya. 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 Sorry. Um, I'm 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 intrigued by the the innovation center and like how, how what constructs would you use and how would you synthesize all these ideas that are coming along because, you know. Um, with existing technology and hybrid models, it's very easy to just go the path of least resistance and kind of m miss out on very exciting new things. So I'm, I'm like, I'm curious about how do you uh, manage uh, like this collection of ideas that you're producing? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, we we have a very clear focus. Our mission is to engage the community with emerging technologies. Um, so and our, the opportunity for us is to create events where actually people can come together, um, like the the design jam or other events like playgrounds where um, you can actually wrestle with some of these concepts and where people who have some science background or no science background can really interface. But the big part of the innovation center is partnerships. Um, and whether this is in the, in the you know, context of quantum or artificial intelligence, um, bringing actually experts early on to inter so that students can actually you know have a real real kind of conversation about this about their own ideas and I think it, it works both ways so a big a big part of that is to create that idea exchange um, within within the center programming uh, very much focus on that um, so uh, really having this interaction between st students with with professional with the tools of professionals with you know, one of the best ideas, and I'm gonna, best set of moments, I think, and I'm gonna reference what, what uh, Sven said, was that our students from, you know, from their homes can, through their classical computers, can actually run equation on the IBM, you know, platform. And that was fascinating to them, because I don't think even when they joined the gym. So it's, it's important for us to really give them a, um, that space, give them access to tools, and in some other cases, whether it's what it's extended reality is also, you know, having having opportunities to play with that. And which actually brings me to another point that a lot of our students felt a, a few of the groups were really interested in in that visualization, in in, in actually, especially as this is such a, it, you know, the phenomena that quantum computing presents. Uh, interesting to kind of, as I said, wrap around, sort of wrap your hand around. And so augmented reality, virtual reality, were natural kind of in points of interest for them to come and, and move this, you know, and, and also play with, within both fields. And I think that's what, um, you know, makes them come back, um, yep. that, that ability to um, really uh, work within within those domains and and have support and uh, I'm really excited that the new school actually gives us a and Lynn and 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 Sven are part of that sort of e you know part of this team of creating the ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Federico. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, my that was an awesome question right before me. I had a similar question, so I had to figure out, you know, how am I going to rephrase? <laughs> but uh, essentially, um, I'm, as, as I understand it, um, you know, we have like the, the hard science that you're working at IBM, and um, you're introducing it early so you can get a seat at the table in, in creative, at, you know, at the new school. And, um, and I'm seeing that, and I'm not sure if I understand it properly, that we're able to take the signals and then use them for like um, artist, artistic purposes. And I'm actually interested in seeing, and this is where my question is similar to, to the one before, um, when the race to space happened, a lot of technologies came out. We figured out how to map <coughs> things in 2D, 3D space as one. And that led to us having like animation and like the world of 3D and Pixar and so on. So like with quantum computing, beyond using the signals in this current state, is what, what other industries, like, entire like creative industries 
do you do you like can you even uh, predict um, with the kind of technology or is it still is it that it's we're taking the signals and that's what we're working with for for creative expression right now so I'll, I'll take a stab at that very non scientific stab um, I think uh, a lot of the conversation around quantum tends to be about what problems are going to be solved that we can't currently solve? And I, I've come to understand that that's not really the most effective way to understand it, that the better way of looking at quantum is more as an optimization tool. Mm. Uh, the reason there are certain, certain problems that can't be solved right now is because we simply don't have the computational power to solve them. Quantum may change that. But quantum can also optimize the solution to many problems. They aren't limited to just things that are better done on quantum. And so in this regard, my answer to your question would be that I think the outcome is, to, to oversimplify it, a much more powerful optimization process. So we can look at solving more complicated problems. Um, I think that would benefit many fronts, many industries. Um, you know, we haven't really reached this point yet. I think Russell would second that. Yeah, but, for sure. You know, the, the, you know, when we talk about thousand qubit computers, maybe we're getting to the zone where we can run some of these algorithms and begin to see some of these results. But I don't think, from my perspective, that it's limited to specific industries. I think it actually, and it's one of the reasons that people talk about this being a major computing revolution, it really will apply across the board when you look at it from the terms of optimization. Uh, I would uh, take a start from a little bit different angle okay. from you. Um, I agree with everything what he said. Um, the different approach I was thinking about is, I think quantum actually bring us much closer to how nature works. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, if, so there are two terms I want to describe. One is uh, deterministic, the other one is indeterministic, right? Deterministic means one plus one equal to two. You run it 10 times, you always get a two. There's no other answer, right? But we know that's not how this world works. You trade stocks, you know, you follow the trend. Yesterday, maybe the trend you should buy. Today, it's the same trend. If you buy it, it goes down, right? So that's, you cannot predict that. So that's actually what quantum machine actually works is based on probability, right? So if we really want to uh, uh, come up with a tool, not to explain what happened, because we cannot explain what happened, really to be able to create a tool such that we can establish a model so that we can predict, right? Quantum is a much better tool than the classical computer as it is. Got some so URLs thanks, over there. Thank, thank you, and thanks to everyone for coming, and uh, thanks to South by Southwest for having us. And